Hello and welcome to a millinery hat vlog. My name is Ilona, I'm a milliner based in London and this time I'm at London Hat Week. <laughs> Today is officially day one of London Hat Week and I thought I'd start the week off by going to some galleries. First off, I went to see the pop-up shop in London's Liverpool Street. The pop-up shop is run by the same organisers who organised the London Accessory Week. And it did feel like it had a very similar atmosphere. Inside the shop it was very quiet, there were no people, no one was really interested in the hats. The shop assistant wasn't very interested in talking about the hats, which was a bit of a shame. But there were some nice standout examples, including this one with some lovely goose bio feathers and some embroidery on the top of it. I think this pillbox is quite special and I'm really glad I encountered it. I have to say, I'm not the biggest fan of London Liverpool Street Spitalfields Market area in general. I find it very full of people and difficult to move around in and very cramped and lots of tall buildings, lots of office people scurrying about doing their daily business, so maybe that slightly affected how I felt about visiting the Accessory Week X Terrace pop-up thing. Goodness, they have so many names I don't exactly know what to call them. After being at Liverpool Street I headed off to the Morley Gallery at Waterloo, which was having a London Hat Week exhibition displaying lots of hats from different military associations in the world. I'm very glad to say I saw some familiar... I was going to say I saw some familiar faces, but I saw some familiar hats. <laughs> As you walk into the gallery space you are greeted with hats to the left and hats to the right. To the left was the display from the Spanish Millinery Association and to the right was the display from the Irish Millinery Collective and both had some lovely stunning hats to look at. The first one I want to point out is by Cristina de Prada. She made this peapod hat for the Barcelona hat stroll and she has an Instagram series about it so you can go and have a look at her Instagram to see all of her pictures. What I like the most about this one is that it specifically matches the suit that she bought specifically for the hat stroll, which was a collaboration between Iris Apfel and H&M. It's just so much fun. It's exactly what a hat should be. It's playful, it's bright, it's colourful, and it suits her very, very well. Then I noticed a familiar name. This is Clara's hat, Clara Lopez Santos. She does a lot of white bridal numbers and this one is just as perfect as all her other ones. From the Irish Millinery Collective I wanted to point out this lovely little red percha number by Laura Hanlon. It's made using cinnamé and crin, wonderfully, delightfully swirled around some flowers. It would really match the dress that I'm wearing right now. And how gorgeous is this one by Eva Kerwin? Look at all that delicate embroidery on top of the windowpane cinema and the little butterfly just in the middle of the button. It's so sweet. Once I turned the corner into the rest of the gallery space, I felt right at home amongst some historical hat examples. These are three hats from the Culture Trust Luton. Luton obviously being the centre of the hat trade in the UK for a very, very long time. And on the opposite wall to Luton, we've got the Hat Talk competition entries from this year. Some stunning examples once again. How fun is this braided straw piece? It looks like a lot of work has gone into this one. And this one as well, it looks just like my millinery work table in my living room. Maybe just a little tidier actually than my space. And welcome to the Netherlands for the Dutch Hat Association display. I cannot pronounce the names of these lovely milliners. What stunning work this is with the hand dyed cinema for this number and then the swirly pink bias cinema for this other number. What an exciting way to use ginseng buntle. This is a hat by Miriam Nuva. Again, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but this is so creative and so swooshy and it looks like it's about to take off. I love it. 
Hopping back to the UK now, this is a hat by Jane Smith, who makes a lot of hats for TV, stage and films. This particular hat is for a character called Gwendolyn from the play The Importance of Being Earnest. I am actually embarking on a little bit of a long-winded research project into late 19th century, early 20th century hats, so I think I shall be looking at hats like this in more detail soon. And with that in mind, here is a hat by Rachel Trevor Morgan, which is a wireframe covered in her handmade silk roses and lots and lots of fabulously pink tulle. This is very Edwardian indeed. Oh, and look who we've got here! It's only JWH Millinery. I've linked to John's channel in the description box below if you'd like to go and have a look at some of his millinery videos. How adorable is this little upside-down flower? It looks like it belongs on the pages of one of my favourite childhood books, The Flower Fairies. And if you peek underneath, oh, surprise pom-pom! And here are some more goose bio feathers. I'm spotting these more and more everywhere I look. I think that means I might have to use them on one of my own hats. Follow me down the stairs as the exhibition is twice as large as I thought it was going to be. And here we bump into Julia Mio's Lotus Garden hat. What stands out to me about this particular hat isn't just how perfectly formed the lotus flowers are, but rather the wire structure with how it attaches to the head. I think it's very clever to have an extra piece of wire going around the back of the head to give it a little bit more stability. Wow. <laughs> is my kind of hat. So many feathers, but wait, let's get close to it. Those aren't real feathers, no. I have no idea how they've managed to do this. It's almost like it's printed onto some kind of stiff fabric to make it look like feathers. And actually close up it looks rather rubbish, but from far away, my goodness, what an impact. Tomorrow I've got a class about feathers. Oh, I have just been talking about goose bio feathers. So clearly feathers are on my mind, but the class isn't on bio feathers. It's about covering hats in feathers, which was quite a popular technique on 1950s style callow half hats. So I'm very excited to learn all about that. I won't be filming during the class because obviously someone else's intellectual property, it's their class, they are there to teach, I am there as a student, but I will let you know my thoughts on how the class went and hopefully I will be coming home with either a half finished hat or a fully finished hat. My speed isn't as fast as it could be and I've got a bit of a sore hand at the moment so maybe it'll be a half finished hat and we'll rendezvous back here tomorrow and chat about how the class went. Tomorrow has now been and almost gone. It's 6 p.m. Wednesday, day two of London Hat Week. I've just come back from the Morley College Waterloo Centre from the masterclass called Fantastic Feathers by Australian milliner Carol Ma. Here are some examples of Carol's hats using this technique. And I'm not going to explain exactly how to do this because if you want to know how to do this technique, you can get in touch with Carol. Some of her classes are available as videos from the Millinery Academy website. What I will do is show you what I got up to during the class. I've brought back with me a whole bag of things. I'm glad I foresaw this happening and took an extra bag with me to the class to make sure I had something to carry a hat back with me. Let's see what I've got. Here is the beginnings of a feathered hat. So these are goose naguar feathers that we use today, cut them in special ways. The hat base itself is made of foss shape. Now I'm not the biggest fan of foss shape, that's sort of the thing I didn't enjoy about the class. The class in general, the atmosphere was really nice, it was a really nice classroom, it was well lit. Quite hot though, but today is a hot day. We did have some fans, but of course when you're cutting feathers, fans blow all the feathers everywhere, so that did keep happening. I want to just explain a little bit about why I don't like foss shape. So in fact, let me just rip these feathers off because I think I can do it better. 
Okay, so why have I just ripped off almost all these feathers after a whole day spent in the class dealing with sticking them on? Well, I don't really want to wear a hat that's Foss shape. Foss shape is thermoplastic and I'm not the biggest fan of plastic in general. It has its pluses, so it is very lightweight, which is why it works very well for hats like this, because you can keep piling things onto them and they'll stay light, but I think I'd rather execute this base in straw or cinnamon. In fact, I think I've got some cinnamon offcuts lying around which I might dig up and try and re-block in this shape. This shape is actually from a vintage block because, surprise, surprise, I picked the vintage block that was difficult to block on. Drusilla, must you make noise? The thing with Foss shape is it can be used to make hat blocks, so this is a pretty sturdy thing that I can maybe reinforce from the inside with a little bit of paper mache or something, and then I'll be able to use this to re-block some cinema or something like that, because the way that it was cut off the block, because it's plastic and it's hard, it doesn't move, it had to be cut off the block at the at the very, very edge, and so it lost its sizing, because it looked like it should have fitted me, and I've had to sew in a whole two rows of folded foss shape to give it an extra... Um, please ignore the ribbon as well. To give it the extra padding, and so it kind of stays on my head now, but I think I can get it better. What else did I learn today? Ooh! Using a steamer while wearing a heatproof glove. Drusilla, please stop. I need to get myself a heatproof glove because actually that was very, very handy to not burn myself, so I will do that. Also, glue guns, not all bad. Who would have thought it? So if you have a good quality glue gun, it's not going to drip, you know, the stringy bits you get from the glue guns. Those aren't going to go everywhere. That's a Bosch model glue gun. Before I sign off for the day, my thoughts on the general class. I enjoyed the class. I like how Carol taught the class, but I did think that the information could have maybe been condensed and it could have just been a shorter day without the expectation to have a finished hat at the end. I didn't go into the class intending to finish a hat and I'm not one of those people who feels like I want to go to a class and finish a hat. I want to go to a class and learn the technique and then take it home, figure out how I can make it my own and then make a hat using it. Which is exactly what I will end up doing eventually. And once I do, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Bylona Millinery because that is where I will be posting finished photos of my finished hat and tagging Carol in them so that she can see and tell me what I've done wrong. <laughs> and with all that, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to a veiling masterclass demonstration by Sarah from John Boyd Hats, which I also won't film during the demonstration, but maybe I can film the hats that Sarah makes during the demonstration just to show you what you've all missed out on. And here's what you missed out on some lovely examples of veiled hats by Sarah Marshall from John Boyd Hats. And here is a photo of Mr. John Boyd during a hat fitting for his sister. As I arrived really early today, I had the chance to wander around Morley College a little bit and have a look at some of the original parts of the building, which are the only parts standing that weren't hit by a bomb during the Second World War, I think. There was a plaque behind one of the doors, which I managed to film, and I think there was a second plaque behind the other door, but the door was open so I couldn't see it, so I'm not quite sure what the full story is there. But anyway, as it's London, it's yet another historic building which I find very interesting, and I feel very privileged that I get to live in a city full of so many interesting buildings. This was a wonderful demonstration, and I've come home with several pages of notes and some drawings as well, because I couldn't figure out how else to scribble down notes fast enough. We learned how to make three types of veil. A nose veil, a flip back veil, and a fluffy, poofy cloud veil. So the first one 
Um, the nose veil can actually also be an eye veil if it hits around the eyes, or a chin veil if it hits around the chin. The nose veil went onto a white bridal style percha. The flip back veil went onto a pillbox. And the cloud veil went onto a slanted percha with a burst of stars from the middle of it. And Sarah very graciously explained all about different elements of those three hats as well. So we got extra information, not just veiling. So it was all very exciting. And there's nothing else much really to say about it, other than it was a lovely afternoon spent hanging out with other milliners. Here is me and Sahar trying on the veiled hats after the demonstration. I'm going to spend the rest of my evening trying to make out what on earth I meant by these scribbles here, so I will go and type them up and make sure I am refreshed and ready for my straw braid stitching class tomorrow. See you then. It's Friday the 6th of August and it's half past nine o'clock in the evening. It's a little bit late and I'm home late today because I went out for dinner. And yet again I'm back with my bag of things from today. Should we go through hat block or bowl? Hat block or bowl? You decide. Lots and lots and lots of wheat straw braid and somewhere at the end of it, there we go, this is what I learnt today, how to hand stitch straw from a hank, I'll tell you all about that in one second, some goodies from the supply affair, I restricted myself to a 20 euro spend. I've got four back copies of Hatlines magazine. I highly recommend Hatlines magazine if you're looking for something to read through, especially if you find the back copies because I think they retail slightly cheaper than a new subscription. Ooh. And notes from the class, which I really liked that everyone got a folder with their name on it. I thought that was very useful, very well organised today. And, oh, I bumped into a subscriber and she very kindly gifted me this little book over here, so thank you so much. And I will read this, well it's, it's more of a picture book than anything, but I will flick through this and talk about it in my book review live stream that is happening at some point this month, so make sure that you are subscribed so that you don't miss that live stream. That's everything hat related from the bag. So, what did I do today? What's all that straw all about? I took a class today from Lucy Barlow all about stitching straw plaits, and Lucy Barlow trained under Jean Barthé, who was another iconic mid-century milliner, and we all know how much I love iconic mid-century milliners. At the beginning of the class, we were all given London Hat Week aprons. Here I am, proudly wearing mine. It's a bit long for me, so I had to fold it to get it around my waist, so you can't really see the logo, but it does say London Hat Week. That was very nice. We did give the aprons back after the class, though, so they weren't to keep. There were lots of students in the class today, but the atmosphere was still pleasant, and I felt that Lucy was still able to walk around and help everyone individually, which you don't always manage with large class sizes, but it was actually okay today. I was a good student, and I came all prepared with my little box of sewing things, my notebook, my glasses, I was ready for the day. Part of the fun of working with straw plaits or braids is trying to untangle them once you cut them off from the hank because we only needed to cut 10 meters each for what we were doing today, but it went everywhere. So we then spent a couple of minutes giggling and trying to gather it together to form some semblance of order. Lucy also brought lots of samples for us to have a look at, at the various different ways that straw braid can be used, including this darling little snail. I have an observation about working with straw that I'd like to share with you all. Because you have to work with the straw when it's damp, it softens it up a little bit, my hands got very, very, very dry. They are definitely in need of some hand cream. I'll be honest, there was nothing in the class that I haven't read in an antique millinery manual. However, it was really nice to have Lucy there to physically 
show us what was going on because the one problem with learning from antique books is that the photographs or diagrams don't always give you the full picture. So I do encourage you, if you can, to have a rounded millinery education and learn from videos, learn from books and then learn from teachers physically or online in classes because that will give you a rounded view of millinery as a subject. After the class I popped into the supply affair and tried very hard not to spend money and to be honest actually that wasn't very difficult because everything was so expensive but I guess that's only to be expected in a cost of living crisis. I found myself really wanting to buy things and then thinking oh actually do I really need this right now because it's priced very high and I don't know if I have a particular use for it right now so yes I ended up buying only these four back issues of hat lines. Shall we have a quick look at them? So I bought the pack of 2021 back issues. I hope I don't have any of these. I don't think I do. I recognise from the covers because I love how striking the covers are. Oh there are some lovely things in these magazines. Right you'll have to buy these magazines if you want to see all these pictures. I am going to have a wonderful weekend flicking through all four of these issues. The most reasonably priced supplier was the trimming company, which I do like their things, I do order from them quite a lot. And I was hoping to pick up a couple of bundle mats today, but they'd run out of green, so that's a shame, so that's why I didn't end up buying anything from them. But if they hadn't had run out, I would be here with a couple of green bundle mats. I'm going to have to see if they're in stock online and order later. After a whole day of sitting indoors and being indoors at the supply affair, I thought I should treat myself to an ice cream close by at the Jubilee Gardens, which was very, very pleasant and lovely. And if you ever find yourself in London, Jubilee Gardens is right on the Thames, right under the London Eye, so you can't miss it. It's a lovely little garden park with ice cream vans all around it. It was fabulous. And after I ate my ice cream, I thought, why waste the lovely weather? So I sat there stitching for a little while in the park, but I didn't get very far because I didn't have any water to hand to dampen the straw with. So I think I only ended up doing two rows, but at least I got some fresh air in today. And that's all I have to say about today. Not very much again, I'm afraid, because my thoughts are just taken up with all the information that I'm trying to absorb from all the classes I've taken. I don't have any more classes booked. I do have a talk to go to tomorrow, which is on the Windrush generation and hats. And I will let you know how that goes tomorrow. I'm back from tonight's talk. It went on for longer than I was expecting it to. It was on for two hours. I thought it was only going to be an hour. And part of me wishes that it was only an hour because I find it pretty difficult to sit for longer than one hour on the spot without my joints starting to ache. It was really air conditioned in the basement room that the talk was in and I got very very cold and my joints got very very stiff and about halfway through the talk I realised that I couldn't wait for it to be over so that I could go and warm up outside. But apart from all that, <laughs> the first hour was really interesting. Alva was very charismatic and very good at speaking, he was very engaging and it was very interesting to hear about his experiences of coming over as part of the Windrush generation, even though he didn't come over on the Windrush ship itself. If you don't know what Windrush is, here in the UK, Windrush is referred to the generation of migrants from the Caribbean who came over on a ship called the Windrush. There were many other ships, but that's kind of what started it off. And in fact, at Waterloo Station, there is a statue commemorating the Windrush generation, which I went to visit earlier in the day and I was very overwhelmed and impressed by the scale of that statue. That statue is massive and also it's very detailed and the lady in the statue is of course wearing a hat. How fabulous is that? When I arrived for the talk I was offered some light refreshment in the form of either a glass of white wine or some orange juice and I opted for the orange juice partly because I am wearing a dress with oranges all over it, but also because I'd forgotten to have lunch. And the reason I forgot to have lunch is because I was making this hat that I'm wearing here, which 
everyone at the talk absolutely loved. This is my interpretation of the stitching straw plait class from yesterday. Let me take it off. It's got a few problems with it, so I will probably be slightly remaking it. Partly the way I've um, sat it on my head, I think it needs to move forwards a little bit more off the band. And the way I've secured it to my head is exactly how I secured my victory visor. This whole thing needs to move forwards. It's kind of like a 40s style mini percher hat. That This is how a lot of 40s hats were attached onto heads. And I've trimmed it with some lemons because oranges, but actually I think this would look nicer as a winter style straw with some velvet bows all around it because the back is a little bit messy and that can be disguised with lots of velvet bows and the top, well it's the top is okay but it's not my finest work because for all intents and purposes this is a sample piece so I will take the lemons out and put lots of velvet bows in London Hat Week is almost over, there's just the walk left tomorrow and then I'm still trying to decide whether I'm going to go to the wrap party. And can you tell me a little bit oh, about you. your wonderful hats today? Oh, well, I love macaroons. Nothing better than wearing macaroons, eating macaroons. <laughs> yes, I made especially for this and also made a dress just to go with it. Fabulous. I also made my dress. So, uh, uh -huh. actually, I just realized I made this hat as well, this is a hat. This would match so well with your outfit. <laughs> Pretty. Yeah. And you, what about your hat? Yes, as you can tell, I love bright colors. I like make me happy and cheerful. So, um, I made these as well on purpose. And it's a sort of like free style cinema uh, shape, like as if it's like smoke that turns into a bow. Oh, so, so, yeah, lovely. that was nice. And it picks up the colors on yeah. your dress and you've matched your nails and your shoes. Amazing. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Any time you'll lamb way, any evening, any day, you'll find us all doing the Lambeth walk. Every little Lambeth girl with a little Lambeth pal, you'll find them all doing the Lambeth walk. I'm here with Rebecca yes. from Rebecca Gray Millinery. Great. And can you tell me a little bit about your hat? Please? I made my hat um, as part of my HNC Circus collection. Um, so this is basically the little big top hat. So, um, so it's made of cinema, and the idea was that it was going to have a fun element and spin round. So I worked ages to try and work that to spin round and then kind of get the candy cane feel. It just spun by Yay! itself. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say Scott. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> 